Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support, please subscribe. The Real Cause of Death of Catherine Howard Now the obvious answer to the question, what killed Catherine Howard, is that she lost her head in a meeting with the executioner's axe. But putting the obvious aside, how would a young teenage woman end up losing her head at the behest of the king? Catherine had a scarred childhood. She was subjected to loss and was forced to grow up before her time. Catherine lost her mother when she was around 10 years old and her father sent her to live with her step-grandmother. It was here, in the home of Agnes, the Duchess of Norfolk, that Catherine's fate was sealed. For within the decade, Catherine would have been groomed by a multitude of men, married to a man who was more than double her age and severely obese and had a temper and then lost her head at the hands of that same man, the King. Catherine Howard was born to an upper-class family between 1518 and 1524, but the exact date is unknown. Her childhood, up until the age of around 10, had not been recorded in the history books, but what we do know is that when she was around 10 or 12, her mother passed away. This meant that Catherine was then moved to live with her step-grandmother, the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk, Agnes. Now Agnes is what we would call a distant guardian. She was not protective over her charge and Catherine was left to do as she pleased, but she was merely a child and a child is easily exploited. The time that Catherine spent in the care of her grandmother shaped her for the rest of her life, albeit a short one. There has been a question debated within the historian circle, and that question is whether Catherine Howard knew what she was doing when she had a sexual relationship with men other than Henry VIII, who later became her husband. But something we do know is that the decisions of Catherine and those around her when it came to intimate relationships are ultimately the ink used to sign the death warrant for the young girl. When she was around 13 years of age, a man named Henry Mannox had intercourse with her. Catherine and the other charges in the House of Agnes were often left to entertain male admirers unsupervised. However, Henry Mannox was not just some male admirer, he was actually Catherine's music teacher, and he made advances towards Catherine. It is unclear if those advances were reciprocated or not, but that should not matter. Henry Mannix today would have been in a position of trust and his advances would have been breaking the law, for Catherine was just a child and Henry a grown man. This relationship with Henry Mannix taught her a lot in the terms of bedroom antics, and when she married Henry VIII it is said that he was amazed at her skills, but again, this was not something that should have been celebrated. Next, Catherine was introduced to a man called Francis Deerham. He was entertained by Catherine and her friends in the house of the Duchess, and Catherine went on to have sexual relations with him as well. In the 1500s, gossip was rife, and the virginity of an upper-class girl was considered an important asset that should be protected until marriage. Reputations could be ruined, and a young girl's prospects destroyed. Agnes, the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk, failed in her duty to protect Catherine, and Catherine's childhood would come back to haunt her when she married the King of England. Now Catherine did manage to keep her past under wraps for the time, and Henry showered her with gifts and he indulged her. Catherine was certainly subjected to her marital duty, but with Henry away from court more often than not, Catherine found comfort in the arms of another man, Thomas Culpepper. It is unknown if the relationship went beyond the realms of just friendship, but this is the relationship that ultimately sealed Catherine's fate. It is said that Henry would have forgiven Catherine for her pre-marital activities, but the fact that Culpepper confessed and Catherine's dirty laundry was aired for the world to see made his thoughts of mercy turn to rage and poor Catherine did not stand a chance. Love letters were found between Catherine and Thomas, and in one he referred to her as his little sweet fool. It is believed that the meetings between Catherine and Thomas were made possible with the help of Jane Boleyn, or Rochford if you like. She had arranged secret meetings between the pair, and it's also thought that these meetings went on for months and no one suspected a thing. It was only when word reached the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, of Catherine's situation and her behaviour whilst in her step-grandmother's household, 
that Catherine's world came tumbling down. What is interesting is that Thomas Cranmer never approved of the marriage between Catherine and Henry, not because he disliked Catherine, but because her grandfather, Thomas Howard, was a strong opponent of his. Cranmer was informed by a man called John Lassells that his sister, Mary Hall, used to work in the household of Catherine when she was just a teenager, and that Catherine had fornicated with Henry Mannix, Francis Deerham and Thomas Culpepper. Thomas Cranmer must have seen this as an opportunity to discredit any supporter of Catherine, and with Catherine out of the way, he could then suggest the name of a bride who, like Anne Boleyn, would favour religious reform. During Cranmer's investigation, he spoke with Mary Hall, the woman who worked in Catherine's household as a teenager, and she told him about Catherine's relationship with Mannix in 1536. She said that she had gone to see Mannix to warn him of his behaviour, and he had told her the following. Hold thy peace, woman. I know her well enough. My designs are of a dishonest kind, and from the liberties the young lady has allowed me, I doubt not of being able to elect my purpose. She hath said to me that I shall have her maidenhead, though it be painful to her, not doubting, but I will be good to her hereafter. Mary then claimed that for a hundred nights or more, Francis Deerham had crept into the lady's dormitory and climbed, dressed in a doublé and hose, into Catherine's bed. Catherine was then questioned about Thomas Culpepper. Cramner told her that he had heard a rumour that they were romantically involved and were about to marry. Catherine replied, What should you trouble me where thereabouts? For you know I will not have you, and if you heard such report, you know more than I. Cramner was searching for someone who had committed adultery with the Queen and Thomas Culpepper was to be arrested and questioned. Catherine also confessed about her relationship with Henry Mannix, My sorrow I can by no writing express. Nevertheless, I trust your most benign nature will have some respect unto my youth, my ignorance, my frailness, my humble confession of my faults and plain declaration of the same referring me wholly unto your grace's pity and mercy, first at the flattering and fair persecutions of Mannix, being but a young girl I suffered him at sundry times to handle and touch the secret parts of my body, which never became me with honesty to permit, nor him to require. Cranmer thought these confessions would please Henry, but they did not. Henry wanted more time to think about the situation, and ordered that Catherine be moved and that the three men sent to the Tower of London to be questioned. Catherine was held at Sion Abbey for the duration of her imprisonment, whilst Henry stayed at Hampton Court. Henry saw Catherine for the last time the day she was arrested. When Henry Mannix was questioned, he admitted he had been employed by the Duchess Agnes to teach Catherine music and singing, and admitting having tried to seduce her. When the Duchess discovered them kissing, she had beaten them both, and commanded that they should never be alone together again. This had not deterred Mannix, and on other occasions she had agreed he might caress her private parts. In his words, he had felt more than was convenient. However, he told his interrogators, upon his damnation and most extreme punishment of his body, he never knew her carnally. Then, over the next couple of weeks, a trial for Thomas Culpepper and Francis Deerham took place and both were subsequently executed at Tyburn. Henry Mannix, incredibly, was lucky to escape this fate. The Privy Council felt that he had committed no crime and released him. Thomas Culpepper, though, was beheaded, and Francis Deerham was hung, drawn and quartered. As customary for the time, both men then had their heads placed onto spikes and displayed at London Bridge as a warning to the citizens of London that treason, especially against the King, was no laughing matter. It is believed that Catherine was aware of these executions and the fear she must have felt knowing deep down that she must be next. What is sad is that whilst Catherine was imprisoned, a new law was passed, a law that made it treason for a Queen consort not to disclose her sexual history to the king within the first 20 days of marriage, as well as to commit adultery against her royal husband. This law was called the Royal Assent by Commission Act in 1541, 
This act then meant there was no need for a trial and the evidence was stacked against the helpless Catherine Howard, who was then sentenced to death. A sad matter of the fact is that Henry did not show Catherine the same mercy he did with his second wife, for Anne Boleyn had spent the last of her days with a small amount of comfort, but Catherine suffered in ways that even today brings a tear to the eyes of those investigating her life. Shortly before the day of her execution, Catherine arrived at the Tower of London via Traitor's Gate and she was led to her prison cell. The following morning, Catherine would learn that her execution was scheduled for 7am on Monday the 13th of Feb Monday the 13th of February 1542 and that she had just three more days to live. The night before her execution, Catherine Howard was told to dispose of her soul and prepare for death. She was to die at nine o'clock the next morning. That same night, Catherine spent hours praying. She is also thought to have practised placing her head onto the block, and according to Eustace Chapwee, Catherine requested that the block be brought to her so that she might know how to place herself. Her request was granted, and the block brought into her chamber. Then, on the morning of February 13th, Catherine woke early and made her way out of the apartment she was imprisoned in and towards the scaffold that had been erected for her execution. It is said that as Catherine approached, she was terrified and pale. She was so petrified of what was coming next, so much so that she needed help climbing the stairs. Once on the scaffold, Catherine was so weak she could hardly speak but she said that she had merited a hundred deaths for so offending the king, who had so graciously treated her. It is also said that she then asked all Christian people to take regard unto her worthy and just punishment with death, for her offences against God, and heinously from her youth upwards in breaking all of his commandments, and also against the king's royal majesty very dangerously. There is a rumour throughout history that states the following. When Catherine was on the scaffold, she said, I die a queen, but I would rather die the wife of Culpepper. Catherine was so weak that she struggled to speak. The fear had taken over her. The executioner then gave Catherine a blindfold, which she then placed over her eyes. Then, as Catherine had practised the night before, she knelt down and placed her head onto the block. There was a large crowd there to witness her death, and as the executioner raised the extremely sharp axe, they gasped. Then, with one swift blow, the executioner struck Catherine's neck and removed her head from her body. It was at this point that the executioner picked up Catherine's head by her hair and removed the blindfold. He held her head up to the crowd and showed her lifeless face and proclaimed, God save the king. Catherine was then taken by her ladies, after being covered with a black cloak, to the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula, where she was then laid to rest. Another sad fact is that when the lords of the council came to collect Catherine from Sion Abbey to be taken to the Tower of London, Catherine allegedly panicked and screamed as they manhandled her into the barge that would then escort her to the tower. The boat passed under London Bridge, where the heads of both Culpepper and Deerham were impaled, and Catherine must have been absolutely petrified. Another sad fact is that after Catherine's Howard body was placed into the ground, her body still wrapped in the black cloak, a large quantity of quicklime, or lye, was poured over her lifeless corpse. There is speculation as to why. It does not appear to be for hygienic or odour reasons, Catherine's grave is the only in the chapel to have had this horrendous substance used, leading to the sad matter that someone wanted nothing of poor Catherine Howard to remain. After Catherine's execution, the day was not over, for Catherine Howard's lady-in-waiting, Jane Boleyn, or Lady Rochford if you like, was next. Jane had confessed to helping facilitate the meetings between Catherine and Thomas Culpepper. Catherine Howard was only around the age of 18 when she was killed. She had risen to Queen of England in such a short time, and after only a year and a half, 
she was executed for treasonous adultery. Her fall from grace is a very sad and disturbing story, for she was just a young girl that had been used and abused whilst in the care of her step-grandmother, and then placed into the employ of Henry VIII, where her life choices led her down a very dangerous path. Catherine had been remembered in history as being the fifth wife to Henry, but she should be remembered for being brave and courageous and facing her demons on her last day on this earth. So the obvious answer to the question, what was the real cause of death for Catherine Howard, is the fact that she had her head brutally taken off of her shoulders. But if we delve deeper into the events that surrounded the execution and that of her life, we learn that Catherine was a pawn in the chess game of others' lives, and it was her past that was used against her. Henry can't have been a kind man to the young girl. He was known to have a stern mouth, and Catherine must have felt she needed a release to help her cope with the life she found herself in. Thomas Culpepper, no matter his involvement with Catherine, was that release for her. And although Catherine's past and present caught up to her, she died at the behest of a man whose public image meant more. He changed the law to end a young girl's life illegally, so that he could then move on to the next poor soul. Catherine Howard was sexually abused and exploited. She was let down by her guardian and men who would take advantage of her. They were given free access to her in an unsupervised manner. Henry Mannix, for instance, was in a position of trust as her music teacher, and he used Catherine's naivety to his advantage. But Henry Mannix was just the beginning for Catherine, the start of a horrendous journey that would end with Catherine paying the highest price. Many may blame Catherine's fate on her actions leading up to the point of her death, but maybe if we just stop and look at the facts, we can see that Catherine Howard was a victim who, like many others, died at the behest of the tyrant king and his advisers. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.